on World News Tonight. Shaky grounds. Earthquake jolts Afghanistan and Pakistan with tremors felt as far as the Indian capital. Sandy skies. Beijing faces the wrath of the Gobi Desert as sand turns its sky to different shades of yellow. Possible indictment? Ron DeSantis jumps into Trump indictment fray as the NYPD is on high alert. Colorful flutters. Monarch butterflies make their 2,000-mile journey to Mexico for hibernation. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and welcome to the midweek rendition of World News. We have the latest updates from across the globe, starting off with our northernmost neighbour, Afghanistan, where a magnitude 6.5 earthquake struck northern Afghanistan, killing two in the east of the country and one child in neighbouring Pakistan. The tremor was very deep at 194 kilometres and its epicentre was in the Hindu Kush mountain range near the remote northern Afghan province of Badakhshan. Authorities and aid workers said very strong shaking was felt in Madakshan and across the other northern areas. A spokesperson for Red Cross said they had no immediate reports of damages from Badakshan's capital but were making checks on other areas. In northern Pakistan's Kai Pakhtunkhwa province, a 90-meter-long wall around a police station collapsed, according to the police district spokesman, but did not cause any casualties. Shaking could be felt as far as the Indian capital, New Delhi. In Muzaffarabad, the capital of Pakistan-controlled Kashmir, the site of a deadly earthquake in 2005 in which more than 80,000 people were killed, people ran out of their homes crying and reciting holy verses. Shaking was felt over an area of 1,000 kilometers wide by approximately 285 million people in Pakistan, India, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Afghanistan and Turkmenistan. Large parts of South Asia are seismically active because a tectonic plate known as the Indian Plate is pushing north into the Eurasian Plate. Russian President Vladimir Putin said that the China's peace plan for Ukraine could be used as a basis to end the war. But Putin also said the plan could be put forward only when they are ready in the West and Kyiv. President Putin later warned the UK that Russia will take all necessary actions if it provides Ukraine with uranium munitions. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese leader Xi Jinping sought to cement their nation's, quote, no-limits partnership in a lengthy meeting in Moscow on Tuesday. The two leaders discussed plans to ramp up Russian energy exports to China, hopes that Chinese firms would replace Western businesses in Russia, and the Chinese leader's proposed peace plan for the war in Ukraine. Putin said Russia was satisfying what he called, quote, the growing Chinese energy demands. She thanked Putin for the invitation to Russia and said, quote, the cooperation in trade, investment, energy, culture, humanitarian and inter-regional areas is developing. Russian media reported the two men spoke for more than four hours on Monday and enjoyed a state dinner at the Kremlin, warmly praising each other as a dear friend. Xi's visit is a boost to Putin as he struggles to make ground in the year-long invasion of Ukraine. Austria. While China has sought to cast itself as a potential peacemaker in the conflict, Beijing's proposed ceasefire has so far been largely dismissed in the West as a ploy to buy Putin time. Ukrainian and Western officials fear a ceasefire would merely freeze the front lines, handing Russia an advantage following a series of setbacks since it launched its invasion in February last year. In contrast with the face-to-face -face meetings in Moscow, she may only speak to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky by telephone, if at all. But in a surprise visit pointedly coinciding with Xi's Moscow talks, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida arrived in Kiev on Tuesday to deliver a message of solidarity and support for Ukraine. Well, good morning, everyone. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken criticized Xi's visit, which comes after the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Putin for alleged war crimes. That President Xi is traveling to Russia days after the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for President Putin suggests that China feels no responsibility to hold the Kremlin accountable for the atrocities committed in Ukraine. And instead of even condemning them, uh, it would rather provide diplomatic cover for Russia to continue to commit those very crimes. China has refrained from condemning Russia or referring to Moscow's intervention in its neighbor as an invasion. It has also criticized Western sanctions on Russia. Foreign policy analysts said while Putin would be looking for strong support from Xi over Ukraine, they doubted his Moscow visit would result in any direct military backing. 
Washington has said in recent weeks it fears China might arm Russia, a plan Beijing has denied. Capital Beijing and several provinces in China will be affected by thick, dense sandstorms that will severely affect visibility. The Centre Meteorological Observatory issued yellow warning signals from Wednesday to early morning Thursday for Shangxi, Hebei, Anhui and Hubei provinces. Many areas will have low visibility weather forecasters said, cautioning drivers on speed. Sandstorms will gradually move south, then weaken. China has a four-tier color-coded weather warning system with red representing the most severe warning followed by orange, yellow and blue. Beijing, which also issued a yellow sandstorm warning, has experienced sand and dust storms over the past several days, causing pollution levels to drastically increase. Beijing recorded an air quality index of 500 today, pushing the pollution level to 6, considered very hazardous to human health. The city faces regular sandstorms during March and April because of its proximity to massive Gobi Desert as well as deforestation throughout northern China. French President Emmanuel Macron is under mounting criticism for governmental deficiencies and controversial pension reforms. He is also said to give an interview to several French media outlets to explain the positions recently taken by his government, especially pushing the pension reforms without a parliamentary vote under Article 49.3. French President Emmanuel Macron is in the midst of one of the biggest challenges of his career, with public anger spilling over, an embattled Prime Minister and the lack of an absolute majority in Parliament. So what are Macron's options as he looks to solve the crisis? The first is a government reshuffle that would see Prime Minister Elisabeth Bourne replaced, a move that would satisfy the France Unbowed Party. Resign, because if you don't, there'll be no normality, so resign. Bonn is not the only one under fire. Several ministers are being criticised behind closed doors. There's a problem in health, housing, education. Action is not visible, says one member of the Democratic Movement Party. But sources close to Macron say a reshuffle is not on the cards for now. Another option, dissolving the National Assembly. We need to go back to the people. We are waiting for a dissolution because it's the best way to get out of this political and social crisis. It's an option the head of state is against, and so are members of his Renaissance party, who fear dissolution could cost them their seats. It could help the national rally, says one member. Another possibility, carrying out reforms. It's important that the president gives the country his vision and shows the action that we will carry out to serve the people in the weeks and months to come. The reforms would tackle everyday concerns, like issues affecting the elderly, improving gender equality or housing. The president is reportedly waiting for proposals from his ministers. And of course, there's the controversial pension reform plan, which Macron is insistent on passing into law, despite growing opposition. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has told bankers that she is prepared to intervene to protect depositors in smaller U.S. banks suffering from different stunts that threaten more contagion amid the worst financial system turmoil in more than a decade. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said that the country's banking system is stabilizing, but further steps may be needed to protect depositors if runs on other regional banks threaten contagion. Our intervention was necessary to protect the broader U.S. banking system. And similar actions could be warranted if smaller institutions suffered deposit runs that posed the risk of contagion. Her comments came Tuesday at an American Bankers Association conference, more than a week after the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, closed the failing Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Yellen said she believed the actions of the FDIC, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury had reduced the risk of further bank failures that would have imposed losses on the bank-funded deposit insurance fund. Let me be clear. The government's recent actions have demonstrated our resolute commitment to take the necessary steps to ensure that depositors' savings and the banking system remain safe. Yellen did not provide details on what further actions may be warranted. She said that the current situation was very different from the 2008-2009 global financial crisis when subprime mortgage assets put many banks under stress. 
We do not see that situation in the banking system today. Our financial system is also significantly stronger than it was 15 years ago. Yellen did, however, add that in coming weeks, regulators will examine the failures of SVB and Signature Bank and re-examine whether current regulatory and oversight protocols are appropriate for the risks that banks face today. We'll be back after a short commercial break with more World News. Welcome back. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, seen as one of the leading candidates for the Republican presidential nomination, broke his silence on the expected indictment of the former President Donald Trump for hush money payments to an adult star, hitting out a New York prosecutor, but also taking a whale swipe at Trump. As New York City prepared for a possible indictment of former President Donald Trump over an alleged hush money payment to porn star Stormy Daniels, in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis waded into the media frenzy, criticizing Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg for what he described as weaponizing his office. He's trying to do a political spectacle. But he also took a veiled swipe at the former president. I don't know what goes into paying hush money to a porn star to, to secure silence over some type of alleged affair. I just, I can't speak to that. DeSantis, who is widely expected to run for president, is seen as by far Trump's most formidable Republican challenger, and his remarks about Trump's legal woes in New York seemed carefully calculated, says Todd Belt, professor of political management at George Washington University. Trump railed against what he called a witch hunt in a video posted on Truth Social, Trump's social media website, after previously urging followers to protest what he said was his looming arrest. Our enemies are desperate to stop us because they know that we are the only ones who can stop them, and they know it very strongly. Belt says an indictment against Trump will excite his base, but perhaps only in the short term. Other than DeSantis and former Vice President Mike Pence, most major declared and prospective Republican presidential candidates have remained silent on the issue. But at least one possible contender, former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, has said Trump should drop out of the race if he is indicted in Manhattan. In an update, the indictment of former President Donald Trump could happen as early as this week, if it happens at all. So far, there has been no official announcement of any time frame for the grand jury's work in the hush money investigation. Meanwhile, law enforcement agencies at all levels are shoring up security for the possibility of an indictment. Tonight, New York City bracing for a possible indictment of former President Trump. All NYPD officers ordered to be in uniform and prepared for deployment today in case of protests. With the grand jury set to reconvene tomorrow, Mr. Trump's weekend prediction of his own Tuesday arrest not coming to pass. The former president now unleashing a new barrage of insults, including labeling his former fixer turned prosecution witness Michael Cohen a, quote, serial fake storyteller and a liar. The possible prosecution could center around a $130,000 payment Cohen says he made to Stormy Daniels on behalf of then-candidate Trump in the heat of the 2016 campaign to buy her silence about claims of an affair with Mr. Trump a decade earlier. Hush money payments are not illegal under state law. Any potential indictment could rest on how the payment was accounted for, a possible misdemeanor case, or in a legal gamble, Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg could pursue a lower level felony. Mr. Trump's attorney noting Bragg's predecessor decided not to pursue any charges. Top Republicans peppered with questions about the former president's conduct today, attacking the Democratic DA's possible case as politically motivated. The UN expressed grave concern over extreme violence in Haiti, which it said was continuing to spiral out of control. The information had been gathered by the Human Rights Service in the UN's Haiti office, with the incidents mainly taking place in the capital, Port-au-Prince. Passers-by shot at random in the streets. School pupils kidnapped and children recruited by force into armed gangs. Extreme violence in Haiti's capital, port au prince that these families are desperately trying to flee. In this incident alone, at least nine people were shot dead and at least four bodies were found in a charred vehicle, according to local media. 
More than 530 lives have been lost so far this year alone in gang-related incidents in the Caribbean country, a situation that the United Nations has warned is spiralling out of control. The abuses uh, against the population, and especially uh, women and children, uh, it, this includes recruitment of minors by gangs. We're now talking about child soldiers in Haiti that are being indoctrinated as, as, uh, at the age of as, as early as uh, eight years old. A climate of fear as gangs now control more than half of Haiti's territory, one of the poorest nations in the world. Prime Minister Ariel Henry, who survived an assassination attempt in January last year, vowed to mobilize security forces to fight against the violence. We will not be able to build the Haiti we want with gangs running rampant everywhere. They must listen to reason or we will make them listen. The UN, meanwhile, is pressing the international community to deploy troops to support local forces. Gang violence has soared in Haiti since the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse in 2021. At least 160,000 people have been displaced. Some of the world's leading makers of flu vaccines say they could make hundreds of millions of bird flu shots for humans within months if a new strain of avian influenza ever jumps across the species divide. One current outbreak of the avian flu, known as the H5N1, has killed record numbers of birds and infected mammals. Hundreds of millions of bird flu shots for humans could be ready to go within months if a new strain of avian influenza crosses the species divide. That's according to some of the world's leading makers of flu vaccines. The current outbreak of avian flu, or H5N1, has killed record numbers of birds and other infected mammals. But human cases remain very rare, and global health officials say the risk of transmission between humans is still low. Still, executives at three vaccine manufacturers, GSK, Moderna, and Securus, told Reuters they are already developing or are about to test sample human vaccines that better match the circulating subtype as a precautionary measure against a future pandemic. Other companies, like Sanofi, say they, quote, stand ready to begin production if needed and have existing H5N1 vaccine strains in stock. However, most of the potential human doses are earmarked for wealthy countries in long-standing preparedness contracts, said global health experts and the companies. It harkens back to COVID-19 distribution, where many vaccine-rich countries inoculated large proportions of their population before considering sharing doses. An international framework for pandemic flu allocates 10% of global supply for the World Health Organization to share with low- and middle-income countries. By contrast, the WHO is seeking 20% for other types of pandemics in the wake of COVID. The WHO did not comment on the potential for vaccine hoarding in a flu pandemic, but said it was fully confident manufacturers and member states would meet their obligations. In all, the WHO said there are close to 20 licensed vaccines against the broader H5 strain of flu. In February, the health organization described the bird flu situation as worrying due to the recent rise in cases in birds and mammals. They also said they were reviewing the WHO's global risk assessment in light of recent developments, including cases of human transmission in Cambodia, where an 11-year-old girl died. Welcome back for more news that's taken on the world in a minute. Classes were cancelled for nearly half a million students across Los Angeles after education support staff launched a three-day strike back by teachers' unions that refused to cross their picket line. The scene had ousted almost all illegal gold miners from the Yanomami territory, its largest indigenous reservation, and will remove miners from six more reserves this year. Police are setting up new Amazon bases and seeking international cooperation on law enforcement in the region. Uganda's parliament passed a law that criminalizes identifying as LGBTQ. The measure hands authorities broad powers to target Ugandans who are already facing legal discrimination and mob violence. More than 30 African countries, including Uganda, already banned same-sex relations. The ocean race fleet sailed close to Point Nemo, which is regarded as the loneliest place on Earth. 
2,688 kilometers away from land in every direction as leg 3 from Cape Town, South Africa to Itajai, Brazil continued. The remoteness sees the crews closer to astronauts in the International Space Station opening the world 400 kilometers above them than anyone else. French journalist Olivier Dubois arrived home after nearly two years of captivity in Mali. Dubois, who disappeared in Mali's northern city Gao in April 2021, was welcomed by war members by his family members as well as French President Emmanuel Macron. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with millions of orange and black monarch butterflies beginning their migration to Mexico on a 2,000-mile journey from Canada across North America. Thank you for watching. Have an amazing evening.